right, Romans chapter 8. This is the turning point in the book of Romans. This is where we get into talking about the Holy Spirit. So, Romans 8.1, this is what it says. It says, There is, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen. So, I just want to make a quick comment on this, because I want to make sure... I've heard a lot of people quote this verse, and they quote the first half of the verse. Yeah, there's therefore now no condemnation uh, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Absolutely, absolutely, 100%, I agree. But let's just make sure that we finish the verse. It says, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So there is a condition, okay? The condition is that you walk in the Spirit, which means that you walk in love. That you don't walk after the flesh because remember the bible says in the book of matthew that many will say to jesus did we not prophesy cast out devil and do many mighty works and he'll say depart from me you workers of iniquity okay those that are working iniquity are those that are living in the flesh there's a lot of warnings in the bible uh in galatians chapter 5 first corinthians chapter 6 there's a lot of places in scripture where the bible says uh, do not be deceived, those who do these things, okay, witchcraft, you know, orgies, drunkardness, you know, um, those that are living in sexual immorality, all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's a long list, but he says, look, those people that do this, aka those that walk in the flesh, are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So let's make sure that we understand that this promise for there being no condemnation, it belongs to those that are in Christ Jesus who are walking in in the spirit which is love okay and love does not go and live in sin i mean like i said going back to romans chapter 6 we're not supposed to be living in sin living in sin makes this promise of none effect because the bible says that if we sin willfully this is hebrews 6 if we sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth there is no longer sacrifice for sin so let's just make sure that we read this Full verse in context, it's taken out of context uh, way too much. And it's, I, I don't even go to churches that do this, but even I have heard um, people quote this, believers quote this, who are living in obvious sin. And you're like, bro, I really hope that you get right with God and don't deceive yourself, man. But all right, anyway, so verse two, it says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Very important to notice here, there is a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and it supersedes the law of sin and death, okay? Jesus overcame sin, he overcame death. And when he plants your, your when he plants the Holy Spirit in you now, now, after you get born again, now that's the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus. The only way to receive that is you have to be born again. You have to receive the Holy Spirit by faith. You have to ask God for his Holy Spirit. So it says in verse 3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. So what does that mean? So what the law could not do, okay, the law could not make us righteous. The law could not make us holy. Why? Because it was weakened by our flesh. Because the law is holy, but our sin, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. The, the flesh, our bodies, we can't, we can't carry out the commands of God. So the law could not save us because it was weakened by the flesh. It says, now God did... Okay, meaning that God did do what the law could not do. So Jesus did what the law could never do, which is make us righteous. And so God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. When Jesus was on the cross, we got to understand this going back to the garden. When it says he was praying, you know, may this cup pass for me. He kept talking about a cup, you know, drinking, you know, this cup of wrath. So when Jesus drank this cup, okay, that the Father had given to him in the garden, this cup had all of the sin of all of humanity. He drank this cup of sin. And it says that he, be, on the cross, he became sin. He became a sin offering, okay, so that, 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 that for us who are unrighteous, there was a divine exchange. 
He that knew no sin, so Jesus became sin, he became guilty of our sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. So he condemned sin in the flesh. He paid the penalty. The wages of sin is death. So he took our sin on the cross. He died. So now the pay, the payment, okay, the payment has been presented. So now our sin debt has been canceled, but we need to receive it by faith and we need to walk it out. You know, the Bible says, walk out your salvation in fear and trembling. You know, we are to live. The Bible says that he that does the will of God will abide forever. So we need to learn what the will of God is. And we do this by studying the scripture. So let's continue on. So it says now in verse uh, four, it says, uh, why did he condemn sin in the flesh? Verse 4 says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Okay. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so it says, okay, so the righteous requirement of the law, meaning like you have to be righteous, you have to be perfect. We couldn't do that. Jesus accomplished it by living a perfect life of obedience. Okay, and it says, this is important, it's fulfilled in us, okay, his body, the body of believers, the body of Christ. But there's yet again this condition of who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, Paul is going to shed some more light on this because I know, like I said, this is, people can take Bible verses out of context, leaving things out, and lead people into error. So we're going to read what it all says, and it says in verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Okay, I think we pretty much all know what this means. Okay, so those that, that live according to the flesh who are driven by their carnal desires, whether it's the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, okay, those who are led about those desires... Okay, they do, they do those, they fulfill what their body desires to do. So let's just say my body desires sexual immorality, impurity, you know, um, all types of fornication and all types of, you know, sexual morality. My body desires that and then I give myself over to it. So that's just an example, okay? They set their minds on those things. So he's thinking about this, you know, he's, he's saying that these are what, this is what people think of. And it says, but those who live according to the spirit okay the things of the spirit so those who live according to the spirit set their mind on the things of the spirit okay so it says for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace that's so important to understand to be carnally minded is death to think of nothing but immorality and to think of nothing but um, addiction to think about nothing but you know alcohol or pride or money any of those things you know to set your mind on that it's death it doesn't produce any fruit trust me like just talk to somebody who is constantly thinking about that I mean it, it's trust me it's not it's not a way it's not a good way to live it's not a good way to be I've I've lived in all types of um, bondage and I'm telling you that it's just yeah, it's death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, which this is so true. You know, when you are thinking of the love of God, when you're thinking of praise, when you're thinking of forgiveness, when you're thinking of mercy, and you're thinking of grace, and you're rejoicing for what God has done in your life, like it produces so much peace. Like it's, it's life, you know, like this, trust me, I've, I've thought every way there is to think. And having the mind of Christ is probably the greatest thing. Uh, it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's an indescribable gift because yeah, I can't do this by myself. You know, I've tried to be spiritual out, outside of Christ and all it, uh, trust me, it, it doesn't work. If it, if it did work, then I would be doing it and maybe making videos about it. But as it is, I've tried it. Uh, nothing works like the Holy Spirit and the word of God works. It just works. It's true. That's what Jesus said. Thy word talking about the father he said thy word is truth and i i agree i come into agreement with what jesus said jesus was right like that's that's like the conclusion of my life is that everything jesus said was correct he's right and i agree with him 100 percent. and so it says verse 7 because the carnal mind is enmity against god okay meaning you could say that the the carnal mind the natural mind okay the mind of man is 
is an enemy of God. It's against God. Okay, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So Paul just said this is an impossibility. The, the, the mind of man cannot be subject to the law of God. It just can't. And so this is something that I take this in, into great consideration because in realizing this, it makes me not get upset at sinners. Like, and I'm not saying that like I'm not a sinner, okay? But I'm talking about when I say that, what I mean is people that are not born again, people that don't know Jesus, that have never had a born again experience, have never had a revelation of God, you know, atheist unbelievers, religious people that don't have the Holy Spirit, okay, I don't get mad at them because it is almost like it's my expectation. Now that I understand that that those people who think with their mind, you know, the, the natural mind, it says that they cannot be subject to God's law, meaning like they can't, they can't do the will of God. They don't have the ability, they don't have the power, they don't have the grace of God to carry it out. So I don't get mad at them. You know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not badgering about them, you know, living unrighteously. It's like, oh, well, I mean, according to scripture, you can't live righteously even if you tried. And believe me, if you could, yet again, it goes back to Galatians chapter 2. If righteousness was possible without Jesus, then he died for no reason. And as it is, he died for a reason, to set us free from the law of sin and death. And so it says, uh, verse 8, So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is so, impos this is so important to get a hold of. The Bible says in Hebrews, it's impossible okay, to please God without faith. So in the flesh, it's in, you can't please God. And without, without the Spirit of God, without faith in God, you can't please God. You have to have that spirit of faith. You have to have belief in the Son of God. You have to have the power of His Holy Spirit to please God. Because those that are in the flesh, you can't make God happy. In fact, that's the reason why it says that our righteousness is as filthy rags unto God. So everything that you try to do, everything that you try to be good enough is filthy rags in the sight of God. And so God is pleased by faith. He's pleased by putting your faith in Christ, putting your faith in the blood of Jesus, receiving the Holy Spirit, and living by the Spirit of truth. That is what lives, that, that, that produces life. That produces a pleasing aroma to God. So it says, it says, verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. That's important to get a hold of. Paul is telling us, we are not in the flesh, but we're in the spirit. If, okay, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. Honestly, when we talk about, you know, this person being a Christian, is this person a Christian, yay or nay? My question is, have you read Romans chapter 8, verse 9? Does the Spirit of Christ dwell in you? Because the Spirit of Christ in a man is what makes a Christian. Not church attendance, not church membership, not, you know, not going to church on Sunday and tithing. That, that, that isn't what makes you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is the Spirit of Christ living in you so that you can become Christ-like. This is really what the Bible says. And it says in verse 10, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. That's why the Bible says that we judge no man according to flesh, okay? But we are in the Spirit. We walk by faith, not by sight. So our eyes need to be set on the Spirit of God. In fact, I'm actually drawn to other believers because it's the Spirit of God in that believer that I am drawn to. I'm not drawn to the outward appearance. You know, the Bible says that God looks on the inside of man. He looks at the heart of man, okay? And my question is, does the Holy Spirit of God dwell in your heart? Because if it does and you walk out your faith by, you know, exhibiting, you know, the fruit of the Spirit in your life, okay, by being obedient to what the Word of God teaches and growing in Christ and abiding in Him, then I'm going to be naturally drawn to that spirit of life that is in you through the Holy Spirit. 
and it's righteous. It is righteous. It is true righteous. It's true righteousness, that spirit of faith. I mean, it's, it's very, I, I don't want to say addictive, but it's very, it's just, it's electric to me. Like, I feel drawn, you know, to those that are, are of, of the household of faith. Um, and I love hearing a child of God speak via the spirit of faith. It resonates with my spirit, and there's an inner witness. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, notice, it's the same spirit. If the spirit, if the spirit of him, okay, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead, will. it says, he will also give to your mortal bodies Oh, sorry. He will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Notice here that Paul mentions our mortal bodies, okay, our flesh. So there is an effect of the Holy Spirit in a man. It says that it will give life to your mortal bodies. The, the King James says it will quicken you. Uh, it will make alive. And so this is totally like a healing verse um, that is just a reality because when Jesus told his disciples, you're gonna go lay your hands on the sick and they are going to recover, the question is why? The reason is because the Holy Spirit in them is being imparted through their hands and it, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that dwells in them, it's making them alive. So everybody in the book of Acts doing miracles, okay, raising the dead, healing the lamed, all of that, okay, was just a fulfillment of the spirit of Christ, okay, quickening or giving life to their mortal bodies. And so, like I said, you actually, you know, you don't even really technically need somebody to lay hands on you to, to be healed. You just need to recognize the Holy Spirit is in me and it's quickening my mortal body because of Romans chapter 8, verse 11. And so many people have caught this revelation and have spoken this verse and have just spoken it over and over and over again to where it becomes renewed in the spirit of their mind. They realize they realize the power of the word of God and they actually receive healing because it's a promise out of the word of God that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that it's going to give life to your mortal body. And this is also one of the reasons why the Bible says if you drink any deadly poison, it will not harm you. It's the reason why Paul got bit by a poisonous snake in the book of Acts. I think it might have been Acts 26 or Acts 28, but he didn't roll over and die. Uh, it was because that same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. If he was not born again, if he didn't have the Holy Spirit and that snake bit him, he would totally have fallen over dead and swollen up like a balloon, no doubt. So it says, verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. So our, our, our redemption, us getting saved, has nothing to do with us living for the flesh, living for ourselves, living our best life now, living our lives so that we can get uh, more material gain and, and, and that we can become wealthy and successful and achieve our plan, our destiny, whatever we want in this life. That's not what God is interested in. Believe it or not, when you read the Bible, despite what some of these motivational preachers are telling you, it actually doesn't hold water when you look at what the teaching of Scripture says because Jesus said, if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for the sake of the gospel and for the kingdom, you will find it. And so our job is not to live according to flesh and live in, uh, like I said, sensuality and, and pleasure and love of money and all of these things. This is error. It says, verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Period. Very flat, very, very bold statement. But this is what he says. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So notice here, we are not putting to death the deeds of the body through the law, do's and don'ts. We are literally using the Holy Spirit, okay? The Spirit of God is going to give us grace to deny ungodliness, and it's going to teach us how to resist and how to be sanctified. And how the, the, the Bible says that, through faith in the name of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit, we can be sanctified. We can be set apart, that we can escape the pollutions, the corruptions that are in this world through the lust of the flesh. The Holy Spirit helps us put to death all of our worldly desires, all of our old addictions, old addictions to cigarettes, 
alcohol, you know, drugs, sex, you name it, okay, those worldly desires, they can be put to death by the power of the Holy Spirit, by putting faith in the power of God. And so it says, if you do this, if you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live, okay? That's important. God says, you know, I lay before you life and death, choose life. So now we know how, how are we going to achieve life in this world, in this, at least in this lifetime? We need to put to death the deeds of the flesh through the spirit and live. So it says, for, verse 14, for as many, as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. So notice here, what is he talking about being led by the spirit? If you're being, if you're being led by the spirit of God, and you're a son of God, in context of what he's talking about, what makes you a son of God being led by the Spirit of God? And the answer, if you go back a couple of verses, if you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh, according to scripture, when you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh, breaking out of old habits, breaking away from malice and cursing and swearing and, and all the self-indulgence of the flesh, when you are doing that, you are being led by the Spirit of God, meaning that the Spirit of God wants to lead you to put to death the deeds of the flesh. That's what this passage is really saying. And I know that we quote this verse, I've quoted this verse, not necessarily trying to quote it out of context, but to put it back into context, that's literally what it's talking about. So it says, verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. Okay, did you know this, that we are adopted in the family of God? Trust me, like do a Google search on adoption in the New Testament, you will find out that, that God has adopted us. God has adopted us. And so that's sort of ironic because, I mean, some people get this, but not a lot of people are talking about this, that we were adopted. And here's the thing, if you were adopted into the family of God, that means that he took you out of another family, that you used to be belonged to another family which means that we were actually children of the devil before we became children of God. The scripture makes this pretty clear when you study 1 John. It's not something that it doesn't sound pleasant to the ears, but it's a spiritual reality that your spiritual father at one point was the devil. And that's literally what Jesus told the Pharisees. He said in, in John's gospel, you want to do the will of your father, the devil. And they were saying, we have Abraham as our, our father. And Jesus said, no, your dad is Satan. And they didn't like to hear that. And so if they didn't like to hear it, then I don't think that anybody else would like to hear it unless they are really zealous for the kingdom of darkness and they boast in it. And, and in that case, like I said, I mean, just God have mercy on them, you know, boasting in, in their wickedness. That's, but I've met people like that. I don't know if I've necessarily been I've never necessarily boasted and been like, yeah, Satan's my dad. Like, I don't think I've ever been that proud of it. But maybe I've indirectly been proud of my sin. And so I was, in a sense, you know, taking pride in what family I belong to. But now I'll boast in our Lord Jesus Christ and boast in his cross and for what he's done for me. So let's continue on here. So it says, um, so yeah, it says, we've received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba, um, it, I guess the best way to really trans, to, to translate that into English would be daddy. Um, and I know that for some people that's a little weird, but really that's, that's what it's saying. You know, when you are a babe, you know, when you are a baby, you know, and you are crying out like daddy, like that, that feeling of you are my father, you know, um, which is, a, it's powerful to get a hold of this because trust me, I could, I mean, I could go into, into some real depth on, on, on fatherhood and sonship because I do believe with all of my heart, it's one, it's at the root of a lot of the dysfunction we have is fatherlessness, not just a lack of fathers, you know, in the home, but spiritual fathers, a lack of understanding of our heavenly father it's the real pandemic, honestly. Um, but I can't really get into it because this is a long chapter and I want to get through it. Um, verse 16, it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay, so the Holy Spirit inside of me bears witness 
that I'm truly a child of God. I know I, I have this inner witness to where I'm not wondering. Like, I know I'm born again. I know I have the Holy Spirit. And I know that God has accepted me. And I know that I have fellowship with him. That I've been reconciled back to him. It's just this inner knowing through the Spirit. And it says, and if children, then heirs, okay? One that will inherit, okay? Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. It's one of those, yet again, it's a, it's a, it's a verse that has a condition. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And nobody likes to talk about preaching about suffering, but the Bible is is completely full of verses that talk about suffering. And although suffering doesn't seem pleasant at the time, the reality is, is that suffering is not a bad thing. Now, yet again, I, I want to make it perfectly clear that I don't believe that we are to be suffering with cancer and sickness and infirmity like that. Um, our suffering is persecution, uh, being rejected for the sake of the gospel, uh, being beaten and killed, scourged, being um, called evil by the world for believing in truth, for believing and standing up for the truth of the word of God and for proclaiming the name of Jesus and preaching the gospel that Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, that no man comes to the Father except through him, that there really is one way to heaven. If there was more than one way, I would tell you, but I am, I am assuring you that there is no other way to get to the Father except through Jesus. He wouldn't have made that statement if it were untrue, and Jesus is not a liar. Jesus is not wrong. Let man, let, let every man be a liar, but God be true. God is true, and he's just. And I'm telling you, if, if you don't accept Jesus for paying your sin debt, you're going to have to pay it yourself. And the wages of sin is death. And so you're going to suffer eternal separation out of your own free will choice to reject the free gift of eternal eternal life, which seems outrageous, but um, people are deceived. Um, and, and, and for some of them, it's not necessarily their fault. It's like they've just been raised to believe a lie. And so I don't get mad at them. I just, you know, I, I just try and, you know, come as lovingly as possible share my testimony and that's why i'm really big into um you know deliverance and and healing because this is a demonstration of the kingdom of god to demonstrate yes signs and wonders and miracles follow the truth of the preaching of jesus as the messiah that the word of god is true it's validated because the holy spirit confirms the word okay so it says verse 18 for i consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Okay, I believe that Paul is talking about, the Bible says that um, in 1 John that what we will become, what it's not been made known, okay, but we know that when he comes, we are going to be like him. The Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 how our mortal body is going to put immortality on. Okay, our bodies are going to be transformed to um, basically reflect the image of the heavenly body. And so we are going to receive a new body, a light body, a body that can never be sick, can never age, can never die. And we are going to be like Christ. That is what I believe it's saying that the glory which is going to be revealed in us. Okay, it says, because this is something that has not taken place yet. And but he's saying, so I'm comparing the sufferings of this time versus... Uh, the glory that's going to be revealed and there's no comparison that's what he's saying so instead of looking at the the cup you know half empty he's going to look at the cup half full he's not going to be focusing on the temporary things he's going to be focusing on the eternal things having an eternal perspective is very important for being a strong believer because otherwise you'll see the natural things you'll get discouraged you'll get beat down you'll get you know disappointed and that's not that's not healthy because when you are at a low point, you can't help anybody else around you. And like I said, we really need to strengthen one on one another, you know, because we all need encouragement. Um, I myself need encouragement, so I know I'm not exempt from this. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. This is a powerful sermon in of itself, 
this is a powerful because it's literally saying that the earth is waiting for us to wake up to realize who we are okay who we are in christ jesus what what has happened at this new birth this new man and this is, could be a powerful sermon i really i can't preach this sermon right now there's too much to get into okay but it kind of explains paul explains what he's talking about some more verse 20 for the creation was subject to fertility fruti not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of god what does that verse mean okay so when adam fell okay adam did not just fall by himself the whole creation okay the whole cosmos fell along with him so now we've got bad weather tornadoes volcanoes earthquakes we've got animals killing each other eating each other uh death is in the world you know disease animals get sick and die you know i mean the fall of man was not just the fall of man it was the fall of creation and so the earth didn't have a choice it didn't choose to do this it's not like the earth sinned but but rather it was it was it was made it was i mean the curse came on the world you know when god put a curse you know on on adam and eve and on the serpent you know a curse came onto the creation so now the creation is waiting okay it's waiting to be delivered from the bondage okay of corruption and into the glorious liberty of the children of god so it's it, it is waiting for the time where the children of god are ruling and reigning where we are stewarding the earth and while we are taking our godly dominion and authority and the government of god is being established on the earth and being enforced and the powers of darkness are not uh, affecting nature are not affecting the cosmos are not being manipulated and used for evil um so uh, let's see here it says 22 for we know that the whole world uh the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now okay so the earth is going through this 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 um, he, he almost relates it to a woman giving birth and so we know that when a woman gives birth you know you've got uh leading up until the actual delivery you have birth pains you know you have contractions and so the earth is going through contractions and it's it's it, it knows that there's going to be something that is going to be birthed you know and and we have this hope you know when christ comes and returns to the earth and puts everything underneath his feet and all of the kingdoms of this earth become uh subject to him and satan is bound for a thousand years and then later after all of that you know the new heaven and the the new earth so the earth is waiting for this for waiting waiting for this to happen and we have a part to, we have a role to play you know and this really has a lot to do with us recognizing our identity taking our dominion that we have in christ and then exhibiting that dominion in the name of jesus and putting things back into order and i know that there's there's we're not going to be able to put everything back into order ourselves that's just a reality okay but while we're on this earth we need to be doing what christ did we need to be living as christ did and christ just he destroyed the works of darkness and so we need to be also destroying the works of darkness over like I said uh, ourselves our nations our, our communities uh the weather animal life etc we need to be demonstrating the kingdom of god on the earth it includes a lot of things i can't really break it down because i could be on this one verse for a very very long time um and it says not only that but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit even we ourselves grown within ourselves eagerly waiting for the adoption the redemption of our body okay so i can relate to this because i was actually crying out to god about that earlier today about how i can't wait you know i can't wait to escape you know uh this body you know and i'm not wishing for death necessarily but i mean i'm excited about you know being in the presence of god you know i'm excited about not having to struggle with temptation 
you know, uh, and I'm not saying that I'm struggling with temptation, but I'm just saying that, you know, while I'm in this body, you know, I have to live a sanctified life, you know, and I have to be diligent in my walk to make sure that I'm constantly subduing my flesh. There's coming a time where you're not going to have to be like resisting the devil, resisting sin 24 seven, you know, to keep yourself, uh, you know, cleansed and washed, you know, whenever that moment of, 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 of liberation, you know, when we are, when we are set free from the bondage of this, of this body, that's not going to be an issue. And so, yeah, we, we are waiting. Okay. We are waiting for this. Okay. We're, we're eager about this. We're eager about the redemption of our bodies because our bodies have not been fully redeemed. Our spirits have been redeemed. We're redeeming our soul by renewing our mind, but the body, okay, this body has to be done away with. This is not going to be the same body that we're going to have for the rest of eternity. And so there is a hope that is that is in the children of God that we recognize. So it says, verse 24, for we, for we were saved in this hope. But what hope that is seen is, okay, I'm sorry. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, okay? So if you see something, why would you hope for it? It's right there. Okay, that's what he's saying. It says, for why Why does one still hope for what he sees? And it's a rhetorical question. Okay, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So in a way, it's almost like this is a good, this is actually not a bad thing, you know. It's something to look forward to, you know, um, because there, there's more, you know what I'm saying? There's more. If, if all there was to walking, well, honestly, hey, if that was all there was to walking by faith with Christ, I would be, I would be content with it. But the fact that there's more, it leaves me, it leaves me excited. You know, I think even the world has caught onto this principle that you always want to leave something, you know, in the future, you know, they're always trying to give you like a tease, you know, of, you know, coming up or next time, you know, they're always trying to you know, uh, get get you to sit through that commercial or get you to wait until that new episode releases because, you know, there's something more that, that, that you haven't seen at all, you know, and it's like, but wait, there's more. And so that's how it is in the kingdom of God. It's like, you know, we haven't even scratched the surface of what God has in store for us. And, and so we're waiting for the redemption of our bodies, the kingdom coming on earth, the glory of, our, uh, you know, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Um, and if he, he goes to prepare a place, he's going to come back and he's going to receive us. So there's all kinds of things um, that we have not received in full yet that is going to be revealed at a latter time. But in the meantime, we wait for it with perseverance. Like we're not going to give up waiting. And so it says 26, likewise, the spirit also helps us in our weakness for we don't know what we should pray for as we ought but the spirit himself makes intercession okay for us with groanings which cannot be uttered okay what is he talking about long story short he's talking about praying in the holy ghost he's talking about praying in the spirit jude 1 verse 20 says but you beloved building yourself up in your most holy faith praying in the power of the holy ghost okay so there is a level of prayer when you're praying in the spirit where you are literally making these these there's these inward groanings you know trust me this is very some deep prayer um some deep intercession i know some of you may have never experienced this and i don't want to get too deep into it because yet again i could be on this passage for quite a long time but just suffice it to say that he's talking about the holy spirit praying praying through through us okay first corinthians 14 talks about you know how uh you know when we pray in the spirit you know our spirit prays and it's being aided by the holy spirit and our our mind is unfruitful we don't understand what we're saying but we're praying out mysteries okay and it says verse 27 now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is so the holy spirit okay knows the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Okay, so we know, if I was to summarize this, basically, when you pray in the Holy Spirit, when you don't know how to pray, you can pray in the Holy Spirit, and you are praying, okay, 
the perfect will of God. Period. The end. That's the that's the easiest way for me to summarize this verse. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so understand this. Okay, because this is another verse that's sometimes quoted halfway. Okay, we all, you know, we know that all things work together for good for those. All things work together for good. Okay, and then they leave out the part to those who love God. So it's very important. You want to love God. Okay, and in that case, then yes, then all things work together for good. If you meet the condition of you love God. And the Bible says you love God, you need to keep his commands. Because if you say that you love God and you don't keep his commands, you're a liar. According to the book of 1 John, these are not my words. This is literally what the scripture just says. Okay. I just wanted to make that, that important distinction. This is, a, this is a verse that's quoted a lot. And honestly, look, I love it. If you're using it correctly and if it applies to you, hallelujah, amen. It's, it's a super edifying verse. I, I mean... I, I speak this verse constantly, um, yeah, weekly, you know, all the time. I'll make mention of this in my prayer life or in the time of praise. Um, and it says, yeah, to those who are, are called according to his purpose. Many are called, full, few are chosen. We don't understand what the purpose of God is. It's advancing the kingdom of God. It's walking, it's walking out in love. It's preaching Christ. It's bearing each other's burdens. It's, you know, separating ourselves out of this world, being in this world, but not of this world. There's a lot of things uh, that this entails, but that's just to name a few. And so it says, um, verse 29, okay, for whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, okay? So, whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. So he's talking about us, okay? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, so notice, I know you can't see it here, but, so we're talking about Jesus being the, for, the firstborn among many brethren because Jesus was a forerunner and now everybody who is born of the spirit and of the water we are now, we are now actually really, we, I mean, according to the book of Hebrews, you know, we are his brethren. And so we are family because yet again, we have been adopted. Now we are all sons, okay? We've received the adoption as sons and daughters, okay? So if Jesus is the son of God and now we are all sons, that makes us brethren, okay? And it says, okay, so those that he foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image, okay? There's a huge predestination debate. I'm not going to get into it. I could explain it, but it would take up a long part of this teaching, and I don't want to get into it because I would really need to be drawing from many, many scripture texts, and that's sort of time-consuming. It's a whole Bible study in of itself, okay? But let's just suffice it to say that, okay, we have been predestinated, okay, to be conformed to the image of his son, so... What God desires for us is to be like Jesus. That's what this verse is saying in short. We don't want to get into a religious debate about it because I know that many people have really tore this verse apart in many, many ways, but we're not going to get into that tonight. Maybe I'll do a video teaching on it. Moreover, whom he predestinated, these he also, he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. The Bible says that by faith we are justified, okay? By the death of the, of the Son, by the death of Jesus, we are justified. In whom he justified, these he also glorified. The Bible says that if we suffer with him, we are also going to be glorified with him, okay? Jesus has received, like I said, a glorified body. This is one of the promises, okay, that, okay, if you, you have been washed and justified in the sight of God, we have this understanding that you are also going to be glorified with Christ. Now, we understand that we are not receiving the glory of God because the Bible says that no flesh is going to be able to boast. We can't glory in ourselves. We didn't do anything, okay? But God is going to, God is going to give us a glorified body. Yet again, this is another, I guess, seemingly... It's easy to debate this topic. What is this verse saying? Um... But I know what it's not saying, and it's not saying that, 
you know, we should receive glory as though we have done anything. Because in the book of Revelation, it's very clear, you know, that all the glory belongs to the Lamb. He's the only one that is worthy. He's the only one that did anything worth receiving worship and praise and honor and glory and blessing for. So I don't believe that it's saying, like, we need to receive glory because the Bible talks about vainglory and us being puffed up and us ending up in the sin of the devil, which was pride. So I don't think that this verse is telling us we need to be puffed up and 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 proud and and take glory from God. I don't think that's what it means. Um, so personally, um, I do believe that he's talking about us being glorified in heaven, meaning us um, receiving receiving our own bodies. Now, like like I said, I mean we could get into the details the the nooks and crannies of this if this was a separate teaching but i don't want to do that um but that's just what i'm saying so it says who moreover whom he predestinated these he also called to be predestinated means okay that god's intention okay like jeremiah okay god called jeremiah to be a prophet even before he entered his mother's womb okay so that's the plan, okay? That's what God's plan was. So he predestinated us. He called us by his grace. The Bible says that we didn't choose him. He chose us, okay? And he justified us by what? By the death of, of his son. God justified us by the death of his son. And now whom he justified, these he also glorified. So that's, that's, my, that's my take on this scripture, Yet again, I know we could get, we could break this down further. We could talk about different viewpoints of what this means. I just know what it doesn't mean. And so, you know, the Bible, for instance, says that, you know, um, we're going to, we're all going to be judged, okay? There's going to be rewards, okay, for how we live this life, being faithful to the Lord, and that we will receive praise of God, okay, for what we've done in this life, you know, and on, on, in this body, you know, how we've lived for God and what fruit we've produced, you know, how many souls we, we won to the kingdom, how many children of God we sowed into and strengthened and helped build up, okay? And so there's that element of it as well. I, I sort of do would say that this has to do with, like I said, us being glorified is really us going from mortal to immortal. That's really what I believe it to mean. Um, I could be wrong, but that's just my take on this scripture. So it says, verse 31, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's a powerful verse. I quote that all the time. If God is for us, who can be against us? You know, because we know that we can have natural adversaries, our adversary, the devil, demons, you know, people that are anti-gospel, anti-Christ, okay? But he's saying that with this eternal perspective, you know, if God is for us, who can really be against us? And so it says, because, I mean, when they resist us, they're resisting God. You know, it's not, it's not us that they're, they're, when they're resisting the gospel, they're not resisting us. They're resisting, re, they're resisting God. And so, honestly, it's like you're picking a fight with the wrong person. You know, it's like when I, if I was to pick a fight with a cop, it's like, no, you're picking a fight with the law. You know, you don't understand. It's who they represent. And we represent God on this earth. Yet again, you're not resisting man. That's what Paul said in First Thessalonians. He says, look, if you don't want to abstain from fornication, you're not rejecting the word of man. You're rejecting the word of God. And and I could get I could give you more examples of this, even in the book of Exodus and Moses and um, sinning against man sometimes turns into sinning against God. Matthew 25, I believe, sort of alludes to this. But anyways, um, that's like a whole nother, I could, I don't want to branch off and go into rabbit trails here. So it says, verse, uh, 30, verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So this is so powerful. I mean, think about it. If God was willing to give you eternal life, willing to give you Jesus, if, if if Jesus had a monetary value, which he doesn't, he's of infinite value, but if he did, if God is willing to give you a trillion, trillion, quadrillion dollars of something valuable, then how will he also not graciously give us other things as well that are of lesser value? 
I don't want to turn it into a material blessing prosperity gospel um, approach. But in short, we need to have this perspective of, okay, God gave us his best. And so it's like, so God's willing to give us eternal life. And it's like, let's just say I have a pain, I have a headache, okay? And it's like, so, so God wants to give me eternal life. He wants me to rule and reign with Christ. He wants me to be a joint heir. But in my mind, I'm like, okay, but I don't know if he wants to like heal me of this headache. And it's like, no, listen, how will he not also graciously give us all things, you know? How will he not also desire to, you know, fulfill all of our needs and clothe us, you know, going back to the, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, it says that you're, how God clothes, you know, uh, the, 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 the lilies, you know, and, and he, 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 he says, you know, you who are, are, are of more value than sparrows, you know, you, you have all this unbelief and it's like, don't you realize like God wants, is going to clothe you as well? Like, don't, don't worry, don't fear, don't stress yourself, you know, because your heavenly father knows what you have need of and, and he, his desire is to give you the kingdom and to take care of you. Not to leave you in poverty and, and abandoned and forsaken. Okay, so it says, um, verse 33, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Okay, it is God who justifies. Who is it who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore who is also risen. So Jesus is going to be the judge. He's the judge. He's going to judge the hearts of men on judgment day. And it says, Okay, so he is at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. This is very important. Jesus is a high priest. He makes intercession for us. Um, verse 35, who shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Okay, so this is a rhetorical question. And it says, verse 36, as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. He's quoting the Old Testament here. Okay, and it says, verse 37, Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This is a very, very popular scripture passage, and rightly so. Verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. So, my big takeaway from this passage of scripture, okay, is basically this. Okay, nothing is going to be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Even if you screw up, make a mistake, backslide, God forbid. I'm not encouraging you to backslide, honestly. Okay, I'm just saying that no matter what happens, okay, no matter what happens, here's here's what you have to take into account because this is this is the best way to look at it and I've got to wrap up because I'm hitting like close to an hour here. But when God made the decision to love you, okay, to save you, to predestinate you, to appoint you unto salvation. When he made that decision, first of all, it was before the foundations of the world, okay? Get a hold of this, okay? Because if God decided to love you at any point in time, and he is outside of time, he has already made a decision to love you. And so this is important because when I received Christ, when God poured out his love on me, I just understood by faith. I understood if God loves me this much, and I felt the love of God, and it was supernatural. It was, like I said, indescribable. The love of God is not something that you can put into words. The peace that surpasses all understanding, glory, you know, and joy unspeakable, okay? Understand that when God made this decision to love you, he already knew, okay? Let's just pretend that you were going to backslide and fall away from God for 5, 10, or 15 years and you were going to return to him, okay? He already knew that you were going to do that when he made that decision, I'm going to love you. I pour my love into you. So in essence, okay, he's already read the book. Let's just say he's read the book. And he's already made a judgment. The judgment is, I love you, okay? Now, 
Nothing that happens from page one to page 100 is going to change that fact. So the reality is, is that if I decided to rebel against God, be an apostate, fall away from the faith, resist God, denounce him, okay, uh, you know, God forbid, you know, resist him, um, refuse to enter into his kingdom, God would love me all the way through that. Not saying that I would enter to the kingdom, but despite my rebellion, he would still love me. I know the truth. I know that according to the book of Ezekiel, the Bible says that God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. So he does not rejoice over the death of his enemies. In fact, he actually commands and says, don't rejoice when your enemies fall. You know, And so God never tells you to do something if he himself doesn't do it. He only tells you what to do um, that he does himself. You know, like, for instance, Jesus said, love your enemies. Well, guess what? Jesus loved his enemies. So God is not a hypocrite. He preaches, he practices what he preaches. And so this is the beautiful thing. Get a hold of this, okay? Because nobody can ever con convince me that God doesn't love me. I know that this is something that people struggle with, and it's understandable. You know, like I said, trust me, I've felt like, wow, I've let God down. I've failed God. I blew it. I betrayed you. Like, I failed miserably. I deserve condemnation. I don't deserve to ever be used again of you. I've, you know, profaned your holy name, etc., etc., okay? And I've felt unworthy, so I know what it's like. But after studying the Word of God, after understanding okay, the full counsel of God, and knowing the heart of God, I can never be deceived. God doesn't love me. Nobody is ever going to convince me otherwise. Period. The end. Because I know how much, how much God's heart goes out for those that reject him, for those that are literally, I'm not trying to be like graphic here, but those souls that are literally burning in hell right now, God's heart breaks for those souls. He's not having a celebration over that. Trust me, he is mourning over that. There, there is sorrow in his heart for those, for those precious souls. And so, yet again, if I know how much that he can love those that oppose him, those that reject him, those that refuse him, knowing that he paid a price for them, he demonstrated in his love that while we were yet enemies that Christ died for the ungodly, so I just already know, I already know the love of God. And so Paul is just saying, nothing's ever going to be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So that is the takeaway. That is the most important thing to understand. If you get anything out of this entire teaching, you need to take that home with you, that nothing is going to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Even if you fail, even if you stumble, even if you, like I said, if you're like Peter and you deny Christ three times, you know, Jesus doesn't say, well, you know what? I'm a human and I'm going to stop loving you. That's not the that's not the attitude of God. And so, beloved, I just I hope that this teaching has blessed you. Um like I said, we're going to get into Romans chapter 9. Um and uh, like I said, this is this is a very powerful this is a very powerful book. Um Romans chapter 8. It's important meditate, understand this. Like I said, rewatch this video. Get get the truths out of these out of these verses because I didn't even go into detail on some of the verses like I wanted to because I wanted to go through every verse and not have it be like a two-hour video. But I want you to understand that there's nothing that is going to ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You need to you need to get a hold of this because if you can understand that, you will run to God when you when you slip up, when you stumble, when you make a mistake, you will run to God knowing I have the Heavenly Father is going to be like the story of the prodigal son where he he runs to meet me that there's rejoicing in heaven that the angels are celebrating when you repent when you come back to God and he is full of joy he loves his children you know and so don't don't put God in a box don't think that he is like I said uh, like a human where you make him mad you know and all of a sudden he's going to reject you and say, you know what, you screwed up too big. I don't love you anymore. No, that's not our Heavenly Father. Um, our, our, our God is a God of love, okay? And so the wrath of God has been satisfied on the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and God's love for you is supernatural, and it is absolutely incredible, and it's unfathomable, okay? It's so great, His love is so great for us. And I know because I've experienced it, 
And yet again, no one can ever take away my experience and my understanding. And so I am grounded. I am settled in my faith. We need to be established with grace. The grace of God needs to be grounded and rooted in our hearts so that we have understanding. But beloved, I've got to go. It's an hour into this video. But comment, share, like, subscribe, comment, questions, contributions. I will respond. Beloved, have a wonderful morning, evening, night. In Jesus' name, amen.